In 1944, Wolfgang Langevisha published the book Stick and Rudder, an explanation of the art of flying. Today, the flying wisdom shown in Mr. Langevisha's book is as fresh and relevant as it was then, without the controversy it caused at the time of its publication. If you read Stick and Rudder, then apply its teachings, you will at once place yourself at the forefront of piloting technique while insulating yourself against the dangers of ignorance. Flying airplanes safely today requires the same set of skills as it did then. Other than major advances in avionics, airplanes have remained essentially unchanged from the days of yore. It is, therefore, in your best interest to acquire the nuggets of wisdom shared in the pages of Stick and Rudder. My name is Reggie Polk, and I am a certified flight instructor. The purpose of this video is to introduce you to the wing and demystify its properties as explained by Mr. Longavisha. Note that I am paraphrasing many pages of information, but using his original words. Part 1. Wings A wing is an odd thing, strangely behaved, hard to understand, tricky to handle. In many important respects, a wing's behavior is exactly contrary to common sense. And most spectacular contrariness of all, in emergencies, when the airplane is sinking toward the ground in a mush, or falling in a stall or a spin, and you're afraid of crashing into the ground, the only way to keep it from crashing is to point its nose down and dive at the ground, as if you want it to crash. It is largely this contrariness of the airplane that makes flying so difficult to learn. For flying is difficult to learn, let nobody tell you otherwise. The accident record proves it. What makes flying so difficult is that the flyer's instincts, that is, his most deeply established habits of mind and body, will tempt him to do exactly the wrong thing. In learning other arts that are comparable to piloting, sailing for instance, skills, ideas, and habits must be developed where there were none before. But in learning the art of piloting, much carefully learned behavior, many firmly held ideas must first be forgotten and cleared out of the way, must actually be reversed. There are situations in flying when he who ducks, he who flinches, is lost. The most important example is recovery from a stall at low altitude. Getting that stick forward and pointing the nose at the ground, that does require courage and no two ways about it. The pilot must learn not to give in to his instincts of self-preservation, but to substitute for it carefully trained reactions. What is wrong with theory of flight, from the pilot's point of view, is that it is the theory of the wrong thing. It often fails to show the pilot the most important fact in the art of piloting, the angle of attack, and how it changes in flight. Chapter 1. How a Wing is Flown The story of the angle of attack is in a way THE theory of flight. It is almost literally all there is to flight. It is THE story of the landing. No maneuver can be fully understood unless you understand this one thing. But you will understand flying and not be puzzled. You will be able to figure out what you ought to do. You will be able to analyze your own mistakes and you will get by. The angle of attack is the angle at which the wing meets the air. The airplane keeps itself up by beating the air down. If one could lay a smoke cloud into an airplane's path, the airplane, in flying through it, would squash it down. The main fact of all heavier-than-air flight is this. The wing keeps the airplane up by pushing the air down. The really important thing to understand is that the wing, in whatever fashion, makes the air go down. A wing is, in the last analysis, nothing but an air deflector. That's, after all, why that whole fascinating contraption of ours is called an airplane. This plane is inclined so that, as it moves through the air, it will meet the air at an angle and thus shove it downward. The angle by which it is inclined, the angle at which it meets the air, is for every pilot the most important thing in flying, for that is the angle of attack. The angle of attack can also be defined as the difference between where the airplane points, 
and where, in an up and down sense, it goes. An airplane always flies nose high, pointing up a little higher than it actually goes. At least, an airplane's wing does. If it didn't, it wouldn't have an angle of attack. And if it had no angle of attack, it would not wash the air down. And if it did not wash the air down, there would be no lift. But still, there is no real difference between cruising flight and slow, mushing flight. The only difference is this. In ordinary flight, the angle of attack is so small that the student pilot does not realize its existence. In very slow flight, the angle of attack is so large that even the student pilot suddenly realizes what's going on. In flight at such high angle of attack, the control feel is rather different from that of cruising flight. But then, odd control feel does not prove that anything is wrong. The controls feel different for each different angle of attack. In short, then, Slow, nose-high level flight is a perfectly normal, healthy, and steady condition. If the airplane seems as yet a little new and strange to you, it is worth your while to take your ship up once to a safe altitude and fly it a few minutes in this fashion, maintaining altitude in nose-high flight with very little power. For what you observe there is the very heart of the matter. There is no other principle. There is an angle of attack. There must be. If there were not, no air would be pushed down, and short of having old Bernoulli himself hold it up with a hook, there simply is no way for a ton or two of machinery to stay up in the thin air. Why do we stall? It's not because of lack of speed. And it's not because the nose is too high. The direct and immediate cause of any stall is always one and only one thing, excessive angle of attack. Excessive meaning for most wings greater than 18 degrees. Whenever a wing meets the air at too large an angle of attack and tries to wash it down too sharply, the air fails to take the downward curve. That's what a stall is. The failure of the air to take the downward curve. And that's how a stall is caused. The excessive demands made on the air by a wing which meets it at too large an angle of attack. The important thing to realize clearly is that the stall is the direct and invariable result of trying to fly the airplane at too large an angle of attack. If you want to understand flight, you have to understand the angle of attack. And if you want to understand the angle of attack, then you have to understand just where, under the various conditions of an airplane's maneuvering, the air comes from which the wing is meeting. The wind of flight is known as the relative wind. Imagine a bicyclist saying, the weather is hot and the day is calm, but my relative wind keeps me cool. As long as he keeps moving, he gets a sort of breeze produced by his own motion. That breeze is not the air's motion past him, but his own motion through the air, his relative wind. The factor that has most to do with keeping an airplane up or making it drop, rendering it obedient to the controls or rendering it uncontrollable, is the direction of the relative wind the angle from which the air is rushing against the wing. A good pilot's feel for his airplane, his almost instinctive ability to handle it right, is in the last analysis nothing but continual awareness of this most important of all flying facts, the angle of attack, which can also be defined as the angle at which the wing meets the relative wind. And thus we have an explanation of angle of attack by Wolfgang Langavisha.